Well, good morning. It is good to see everyone out. We do have a lot that are visiting with us this morning. Good to see you uh, here with us. Worship our God together. Uh, you know, the church here at Kaysville, who we are, we're a group of people uh, who are devoted to following Jesus. Uh, we do our best to, to do that and to follow his word. And so if you're here this morning, you uh, want to know more about us, maybe you have some questions, don't hesitate to reach out. We'd be more than happy to talk with you about that. Um, lo- I love you guys. I won't say that enough. After a little bit of a hectic week we've had, it's good to be here with you this morning to worship together. Uh, we're going to be talking about a memorable story from the Old Testament. When the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. We just sang about it, right? Hard hard to miss that from the hymn we just sang. But we're going to be in Joshua chapters 5 through 6. And I want to hit the ground running. Notice how chapter 5 of Joshua begins. Joshua 5 verse 1. And it says, As soon as all the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west, and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan for the people of Israel until they had crossed over, Their hearts melted, and there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. This verse picks up right where we left off last week. Last week in our lesson, we talked about the first four chapters of the book of Joshua. If you weren't here for that, that's okay. I'll do my best to fill you in as we go along. But this is where God miraculously stops a river, miraculously stops the Jordan River, just stopped it, and it stood. the water stood still, and all the people of Israel, which right, several, probably million people at this time, passed through on dry ground. And so here in Joshua chapter 5, Israel has crossed the Jordan River, and they are finally in the promised land. They finally have made it. And the residents of Canaan, the people of that land, they hear about what has happened. And what is their reaction? Well, it's probably how any of us would react, right? I mean, a a big gulp, right? There, There is fear in their eyes. And can you blame them? Can you blame them? I mean, what have their wooden and metal idols ever done? What, what, what could they claim as proof of what their, their so-called called gods have done? Can they claim anything like what that of Yahweh has just done, that he has stopped the river and over a million people have passed through? Not even close. And so I've already spoiled that something amazing is going to happen when God's people get to the city of Jericho. But we get some details of what they do now that they are here in the promised land, that they've crossed over into the Jordan. And the first 12 verses of chapter 5 give us some insight into what exactly happens. And something kind of shocking appears in the first nine verses. And that is that this new generation... Right, Because the older generation has died off in the wilderness, and so the, the, the new generation that has crossed over, all of them need to be circumcised. And verses 4 through 7 of this text kind of explain the rationale, why they had to be circumcised. And so let's read that. Joshua chapter 5, I'll pick up in verse 4, and we'll read through verse 7. And it says, this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the males of the people who came out of Egypt, all the men of war, had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. Though all the people who who came out had been circumcised, yet all the people who were born on the way in the wilderness after they had come out of Egypt had not been circumcised. For the people of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness until all the nation, the men of war, who came out of Egypt perished because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. The Lord swore to them that he would not let them see the land that the Lord had sworn to their fathers to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. And in verse 7, so it was their children whom he raised up in their place that Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And so notice as we read that, it's a little bit repetitive almost as we read these few verses, that it, real, that it reveals that the current generation has not been circumcised yet. It doesn't give us any rationale for why that is the case. It just says that they have not been circumcised. And I won't speculate on what the text does not reveal. But we know that circumcision has always been an important marker, kind of an identifier in the Old Testament for God's people, His chosen people. It was meant to be a a sign of their covenant relationship that they had. And we're going to hit the ground running this morning. I got an application point. I have the typical three at the end, but I want to kind of share one with you right here at the beginning because there is a note of irony that exists in what we just read. Right in verses five through six, the Exodus generation who was circumcised, what happened to them? They died off because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. But then in verse seven, in contrast, it is their children, those who are uncircumcised, they are the ones that get to enter the promised land. They're the ones that God raised up. 
And I want you to see that in that is a warning for us. That those who came out of Egypt, who had been circumcised, they had the mark of God's people. On the outside, they were, by every definition, they were God's people. But the problem was, they did not obey the voice of the Lord. What does that mean? Well, it means that you can have all the marks of the people of God, but lack the response of God's people. The response that God truly desires, not behaving like it, right? That that you can externally belong to God, but internally be far from Him. The Apostle Paul will actually make this very point in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 1 through 5, and I'll put that there as your reference. I'm not going to read that passage, but Paul's point is quite simple. He says that you can experience the exodus, talking about the people in the past, right? You can experience the exodus. You can eat the manna. You can see water come from a rock. And you can see all of these great things. And guess what? You can still remain in unbelief. You can still be a person who does not have faith, the type of faith that you ought to have. Or simply as we might think of it, you can see all those things and your heart be unmoved. Your heart be unchanged. And let that be a lesson for us. Right, we, we are not saved because of where we sit on Sunday mornings or how we dress, external markers. We may claim membership among God's flock, but that doesn't mean we have a relationship with the shepherd. We may live in the king's country, but reject his sovereignty, his rule, and his reign. When the prophets foretold of the new covenant, it was to be different from the Old Testament, mainly because of how it was written. The, the new covenant would not be written on tablets of stone like in the old law. The new law, the new covenant would be written where? Written on the heart, etched on the heart. Prophesied in Jeremiah 31, fulfilled in Christ and quoted in Hebrews chapter 8. And so what a warning this is for us, that the Exodus generation had all the marks of God's people, and yet they didn't act like that. And so let's be a people who follow God's word externally, yes, but inwardly changed and transformed as well. But something else kind of substantial happens in Joshua chapter 5. Not only is this new generation circumcised, but they observe the first Passover. They have observed Passovers before, but this is a new one, kind of a unique one. They're finally in the promised land. And if you want more thoughts and more notes on that, I would say go read the weekly encouragement. I wrote about that this week, shared some what I thought were good thoughts, mainly because they weren't my own. I just stole it from a book that I was reading. So if you want uh, more on that, read the weekly encouragement. If you don't know what the weekly encouragement is, but you're curious about it, see me afterwards. I'll forward you that email. But I want to read verses uh, 13 through 15 of Joshua chapter 5. And before we just jump in and read this text, I want you guys to do something for me. I want you to be thinking about as we read this, who is this that Joshua is talking to? Who is this this person that appears before him? Okay, so ask yourself that question as we read this text. Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. Listen to what it says. It says, when Joshua was, was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with this drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, no, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped him and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take off your sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So who is this? Who is this? It would seem that Joshua doesn't know at first either, right? Because he sees this person coming, and it's kind of a weird picture, right? He has a sword drawn in his hand, and Joshua asks the question, like, hey, are you for us or for our adversaries? Like, which, which side are you on? And I love the response he gets, right? What does he get? He asks a question, are you for us or for our adversaries? And the answer is no. Like, right, some of you laughed even when we read it. Like, you realize that doesn't really answer the question in a sense. But it starts to reveal his identity of who Joshua is talking to. But it almost reads like a rebuke, like, Joshua, you asked the wrong question. I am who I am. I'm the commander of the army of the Lord. And I would say verses 14 and 15 really help us understand, identify who is Joshua talking to. That this is not merely a divinely sent messenger or angel. I I would suggest to you that this is the Lord that is before him. Because mainly supporting that in verse 14 is what is Joshua's response, right? He, he falls before him and, and worships him. 
And there's some debate in the scholarly world on the type of worship that Joshua offers to him because only the Lord in the Bible, only the Lord, never his servants, uh, ne never angels accept worship. Only the Lord accepts worship. And so some people debate on what type of worship Joshua does when he falls down. Is it just that of respect? But maybe even further supporting that this is the Lord is we kind of get a flashback of what happened in Exodus chapter 3. Some of you, it's hard to miss, right? If you remember that story, when Moses at the burning bush, right? Where he, he sees that bush that's burning, but yet it's not being consumed, right? What a weird sight that must have been to witness. And the first thing he's told to do is to do what? Take off his sandals. Or he's standing on holy ground. And we kind of get to Exodus 2.0 again, like we talked about last week. But either way, what a relief this interaction must have been for Joshua. Re relief because the ultimate responsibility of this battle is not going to be on Joshua. It's not going to be on his soldiers. Who, who is here? Who, who is in front of him? It's the commander of the Lord's army. They will not be fighting alone. I would suggest to you they won't even be fighting this battle. The Lord will be fighting this battle. And I think an important principle we, we can learn that takes place in these, these few verses in this interaction here. right? The, the question... That's oftentimes we like to ask, you know, is God on my side? But I would suggest to you that that's a bad question. That's the wrong question. That, that's the wrong way of looking at it. And that's kind of how the situation turns a little bit in how the commander of the army of the Lord responds. The question isn't, is God on my side, right? Rather, it should be, am I on God's side? Why, why do I clarify that? You know, why is the distinction even necessary? Well, because God is God. He is always right. He, he is always just. He is always on the right side, the winning side. And I need to make sure I, in my life, in my will, is aligned with him. We understand that as disciples of Jesus today, Jesus doesn't fit around my life. Right? He, he doesn't bend his will to how I want to live. No, discipleship is all about forming my life around Jesus, the commander of my life. And so we need to make sure we're asking the right type of question. Not, is God on my side, but am I on God's side. We get to chapter 6, and I would assume from the way the text uh, lays out for us, I know there's a chapter division marker, it would appear that the Lord is continuing to speak to Joshua. It will bring that out for us. But let's read the first five verses of this chapter as we kind of get to the city of Jericho and what's going to take place. These verses are really important for what's going to happen here. Joshua chapter 6, First five verses. It says, Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus shall you do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of horns, rams before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. Verse 1 I want to start in this verse because verse 1 gives us like a parenthetical aside is what we might call it. Some, some translations will even put parentheses around verse 1 because it almost seems like we're getting like this, this small detail uh, that takes place aside from the conversation at hand. And that, but that doesn't mean verse 1 is unimportant or it's just kind of a random thought. No, it gives us context of the situation Israel is facing, right? Jericho, it's hard to miss, right? You got roughly, I would guess, maybe 1.5 million people on your doorstep. Kind of hard to miss that. And they know what's coming. They've heard the stories about Yahweh and what he's capable of, what he's just done, and their hearts have melted. And so what do they do? They close the doors. No one goes in. No one goes out. It's letting us know that this is a fortified city, and there are no dummies to what is coming next. They know battle is coming. But I, I would suggest to you that, that verse 1 should help us to be more impressed with verse 2. That despite what is taking place in verse 1, the people are kind of, you know, shutting themselves in, preparing for battle. What does the Lord say? Just matter of factly, like, I've given Jericho into your hand. I mean, we, we should be impressed with that verse. That, that he's saying, assuring them, victory will come. But just like when they crossed the Jordan in Joshua chapter 3, did you notice what's, what will take center stage as they're marching around the city? It's the Ark of the Covenant. 
And the Ark of the Covenant it plays a central role in this chapter. It's going to appear, that, that phrase will appear 10 times in this chapter. Because it's letting us know something. It will be Yahweh's presence. It will be Yahweh's power that will make the difference. He is going to be the one giving them the victory. Not by their strength, not by their might or what they do. And so these are the instructions Joshua will go down in the next few verses and uh, he'll tell the people, uh, give the priests instructions, make sure everybody knows their role, and they start to do this. And the unique thing was, right, on the seventh day, how many times did they march around? Seven times. But let's read about kind of how this plays out. The people follow the instructions. Let's read verses 15 through 21. It says, on the seventh day, they rose early at the dawn of the day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who were with her in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. sent." Verse 18, But you keep yourselves from 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 the things devoted to destruction. Lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But all the silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are are holy to the Lord, for they shall go into the treasury of the Lord. And the people shouted, and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout, and the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured the city. Then they devoted all in the city to destruction, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys with the edge of the sword. We see that the people do as they are commanded. They're marching around, and the wall fell down flat, as the ESV puts it. Have you ever thought about this, that if someone was trying to make a movie of Joshua chapter 6... Going off of what the Bible says, it would be a kind of a lame movie. Because we're not given many details, are we? They would have to put their own spin on it. We're, we're just given, I mean, it's kind of striking, right? For this great event that takes place, I'm not downplaying what God has done, right? The walls fall down flat, but we just get like a verse and a half. That's all we get, one and a half verses. And that, that's just it, kind of a matter-of-fact report. That this is what happened, and they did it. Maybe that that should give us a clue. Maybe that should be an indicator for us as we critically read this that maybe the emphasis is somewhere else in what God is doing. Because notice what gets a little bit more attention is what follows in verses 22 through 25. It says, But the two men who had spied out the land, Joshua said, Go into the prostitute's house, speaking of Rahab, and bring out from there the woman and all who belonged to her as you swore to her. So the young man who had had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and brothers and all who belonged to her. And they brought brought all her relatives and put them outside the camp of Israel. And they burned the city with fire and everything in it, only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. But Rahab the prostitute and her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And she has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. What an interesting passage. That we're given a little bit more details about what happens to Rahab than the destruction of the city of Jericho itself. That the story of Rahab, what we see is it's salvation in the midst of judgment. Salvation in the midst of destruction. Sandwiched between that destruction, we read about Rahab, just a quick little story of salvation that her and her family are spared, and they, from verse 25, it would read that they begin a life among God's people. The spies honor their word, and Rahab becomes now a memorable name in the lineage of God's people. As we close this morning, let me give you three quick applications as we think about Joshua chapter 6 specifically, but I want to continue talking about this idea of Rahab, that Rahab becomes, that salvation comes to an outsider. She, Rahab is a woman whose story is fascinating, is it not? She's noted for her disreputable background, her, her, her work as a, a, as a prostitute, as a harlot. Even the New Testament will comment on that, but yet that's not really how she is to be remembered, is it? That, that, that's not the key takeaway that when we think about Rahab that we should associate her with, that she is rather welcomed into the fold of God's people. 
an outsider becomes an insider. I would imagine that there were some in Israel who found that kind of offensive, right? You imagine the celebration, the scene after they've taken the city of Jericho, and then someone's like, well, who is she? Right? Like, how, how did she get in? Who, who let her in? But it reminds us today, I think that's a great teaching moment for us. It reminds us that the church today isn't for just upper and middle class people who look clean and come from good family backgrounds and every, everything's just nice and put together in their life. Rather, who should be a part of the church if it's not sinners? Isn't that what we see in the New Testament? Think about it. Rahab is where an outsider finds salvation in a place among God's people. Barring the language from Ephesians chapter 2, it is where an outsider becomes an insider. And that rarely happens in the Old Testament. And so we should not be surprised then when we see the fullness of God's plan as we have been studying in our Sunday morning class in the book of Ephesians. We should not be surprised by when God today takes those who were far off and brings them near. And how does he do that today under the new covenant? He brings them near by the blood of Jesus. By Jesus is how that happens. And that's Ephesians 2 and verse 13, borrowing that language. And so we need to see that Rahab is a picture of how faith and salvation in God is accessible to all people. And that Rahab's past, again, it didn't seem to bother biblical authors in how they described her. Rather, she is remembered in the New Testament as being a person of faith. Her her works is what's highlighted. But not only that, I would say the most surprising verse that we have about Rahab in the Bible is Matthew chapter 1 and verse 5. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 5, and her name just appears in a long list of names. But her name appears in the genealogy of Jesus. And what is an amazing thought that is, that she not only found a home among God's people, but is used in God's plan for preserving the, the line, the ancestry of the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so, so much more could be said on that. But I hope we appreciate the significance of salvation coming to an outsider and what Rahab experiences because of the mercy of God, but also for her kindness that she showed. But something else that that sticks out to me, an application I want us to think about from Joshua chapter 6, is just the, the uniqueness of God's plan. I think this is probably why Joshua chapter 6 is one of the more memorable chapters in all of the Old Testament, why a lot of our kids know the story and they, they, they like the march around. Every teacher loves to teach, you know, when it's Joshua's time, right? Have the kids march around the room seven times and you, you, you act that out. But this sticks out to us because this isn't the way that battles work. This isn't how you fight another nation, uh, another, another country, I know my military expertise is zero, okay? It's next to nothing. But even someone that knows nothing about strategies and and how to attack can see that this isn't how it normally works. This isn't what you normally do. And you know, you never see this strategy ever used again by any nation throughout history. Maybe some have marched around, but it didn't end at the same result in Joshua chapter 6, that's for sure. This isn't how you win a battle. But the uniqueness of what they are instructed to do should point us and point everyone to see what? To see God's power, to see God's glory, and who actually gave them the victory. You know, something we read about in these verses, mainly like verses 1 through 5, and even in verses 16 through 21, that the people, when they march around the city, they're not supposed to make any noise. Did you pick up on that? The only sound that would be had is what? The seven priests with the seven trumpets. That's it. So here's like this scene. I mean, can you imagine being in the city of Jericho and witnessing this? I can't imagine how weird that would be. Like, there they go. They're marching around again. But the people are like quiet. They're, they're quietly marching around, and there's just a ram's horn, a trumpet that's being blown. No taunting, no battle cries, no nothing. And it's not until they give the the final command that they are able to make a loud shout and the walls come tumbling down. Joshua 6 is a good reminder that this is the way that God often works, is it not? That God often works in ways that are unique, that are strange, that, that baffle our minds, that we the way we, we see his plan unfold and what he does we kind of read it and we say, well, that's not how I would do it. That's not normally how something plays out. 
it's, it teaches us so much about who our God, who our God is. But all of this, I would say, pales in comparison to where that is seen in the cross, is it not? Where, where God accomplishes his will in such a unique way, in such a way that, that confounds the people. And the cross to this day confounds people as well. Read, read with me how Paul comments on this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. See, see, this is the way that God has always worked. He works in a way that doesn't have to make sense, that doesn't have to be the way that we would normally do things. But the end result, guess what? It's always perfect. God's will is accomplished, and it happens in a way that glorifies and it magnifies his name. There would be no doubt from anybody, mainly from God's people, right? That when those walls come crashing down and they go into the city and they devote those things to destruction and, and the, the metals to the Lord, there would be no doubt from God's people of how they got that victory. That it wasn't by their strength, it wasn't by their might, it was by the Lord. We need to remember that in our lives today. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 31 is a great motto that we need to live by. But the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Don't boast in your strength. Don't boast in your wisdom. Don't boast in your might. Boast in the Lord. And lastly, we need to be a people who have a faith to walk in circles. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 30, part of the scripture reading that Jeremy read for us. By faith, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. It's God's power, like we've been discussing, right? It's God's power that made victory at Jericho possible. But the people had to respond appropriately, too. They had to respond in faith. And thankfully, God has provided them with the confidence to put their faith in Him, to put their trust in Him, a faith that's willing to do something that may make us scratch our heads, a faith to, yes, literally, walk in circles. We need to be a people of faith today. I've heard this story several times growing up, but the story is told of a church that's composed mainly of farmers in the Midwest, and there was a, just a bad drought that they were experiencing. And so one Saturday night, they pulled all the people together, and they had a prayer meeting, and they prayed for hours that the Lord would send rain, that the drought would be ended. There was a little girl that was there that night, and when she arrived for worship the next morning, she began to cry. You know why she began to cry? Because when she got there at worship that next morning, she was the only one that brought an umbrella. And that story has always stuck with me. It's probably one of those preacher stories, just an illustration more or less. But it stuck with me for so many years. And sadly, sometimes I don't think we understand what it means to live by faith, to truly be a people of faith. In the context of the book of Joshua, faith, if faith is the very thing that kept that Exodus generation from entering the promised land. They didn't believe that God would be able to help them conquer the people of Canaan, and so they cowered in fear. And as a result, none of them, none of them except for two families, Caleb and Joshua, get to enter this promised land. Not even Moses. Not even Moses. See, without faith, Hebrews 11 tells us it is impossible, impossible to please God. Look, do a word search on the word impossible in your Bibles. It doesn't appear very often. An absolute of that, that size does not appear very often, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. What that means for us when we think about our, our stance in, in relationship with God under the new covenant, without faith. We will not enter the promised land, the eternal promised land, the, the Sabbath rest that we are so longingly looking forward to. See, we, like the people of Israel, are waiting rest for the, the land that's been promised to us, the inheritance. We talked a little bit about that in our Bible class this morning. 
And that is why when you get to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews is loaded with exhortations for the people to hold fast, to stay strong, to hold on to their faith. See, because if you lose faith, you will lose your inheritance and you will miss out on what God has promised to you. And so I want to end with this passage here in Hebrews chapter 4, which is a great exhortation for us to live by faith. And so Hebrews chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. It says, For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath Sabbath rest for the people of God. For, for whoever has entered God's rest has also, entered, has also rested from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. See, we are called to be a people who hang on, people who hold on, a people who walk by faith, live by faith. A faith that, yes, is willing to do even what the world may see as strange, a faith that's willing to walk in service. Let me suggest to you this, that when I mention the phrase of faith to walk in circles, that doesn't mean we just wander aimlessly. It doesn't mean we walk around blindly in our lives. No, what I mean by that is we have a faith that's willing to go wherever the Lord directs us, wherever he calls us to go. Faith to believe that when I heard the gospel and believe in Jesus and I'm washed in the waters of baptized, that I am truly cleansed, that I am truly justified, sanctified, redeemed. Some people may look at what happens in the waters of baptism and say, you're just getting wet. But it's so much more than that. Faith that God's will will be accomplished, that salvation can be achieved in my life because of what he has done. Faith to believe that my soul can find assurance and peace in Christ and in him alone. And so if you're here this morning, do you, do you have that type of faith? You have that type of faith, but maybe you have not yet come to Jesus, acting on that faith and being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. If, if, if you are here this morning and you're ready to put on Christ, we'd be happy to assist you with that. And so if you're here and subject to heaven's invitation anyway, I invite you to come to the front as we stand and sing the song selectively.